Romans chapter 5, if you'd like to stand uh, with us this morning, beginning at we're re we're reading at verse number 6. It says, For when we were, were yet without strength, in, to, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet preadventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I've got a, a, a sermon this morning. I just want to entitle the, the garden. And uh, there's three points I want to go uh, and share with you today, and that is the, the garden of Eden, the garden of Gethsemane, and the garden of your heart. So if you'll bear with me, I'll start off this morning with the garden of Eden. In Genesis 2, I'm going to be skipping around. I'll read seven, verses 7 through 8 and then 16 through 17. It said, And the Lord formed man out of the dust of the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul, and the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed, and the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. This morning at the Garden of Eden, you know, Brother Kobe brought it out how wonderful it is that, you know, we're not uh, you know, we're not all of the other create, creations that God has made. We're not the other creatures that God has made. But God himself breathed into us. He, God himself breathed the breath of life into Adam's lungs. And Adam became a living soul. And we look this morning and we think about this Garden of Eden. I, I believe if... Uh, if you would, would for a minute just let your mind, I mean you probably have before, but just let your mind wander this morning a little bit with me. I, I could imagine the Garden of Eden being a place of, of spectacular beauty this morning. I, I, I believe that it was a place of of peace and tranquility and harmony. I believe there was just the just everything that worked in unison. I, I believe there was this beauty. I believe there was no uh, there was nothing that was unblemished. There was no flaws. Uh, you know, sometimes we get uh, these blights sometimes in our tomatoes. You know, when we grow them, or sometimes the flowers don't bloom like they should. Trees don't uh, uh, have spread forth leaves like they should. You see sickness and disease in trees and and everything going on in this world today. But here I believe every leaf was fully developed. I, I believe that every flower was in, in its perfection. I believe that every every fruit of the garden or the ground that was there that was perfect, there was nothing wrong with it. There was nothing flaw. It was flawless. I don't believe there was worms in the apples. Amen. I don't believe there was rot on the vine. I believe God had a place prepared for man that was beyond anything they could ever imagine. I believe it was a place that they could get anything they ever desired. I believe this place, not only that, but I believe that if there was perfection and taste and, 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 and help me this morning not to get you too hungry before we let out of here this morning. But, you know, sometimes you you know you can bite into an apple, and, and I like apples, and I, I like apple pies and things like that. But, you know, you can bite into apple sometimes, and that's a good apple. You can bite into apple other times, and it, it's soft. You know, I hate a soft apple. That's just nasty, you know. You get a soft apple, sometimes you get it's bitter. You know, sometimes you get an apple nowadays, it just ain't right. You know, there's something wrong. It's something off. Some of them are deformed or defective or weird or whatever. They, 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 they do have worms in them sometimes. Thankfully, I've never ran across that. Amen. But it's not the same. But oh, in the Garden of Eden, you could get any fruit you wanted. Anything that, that you like, you say, well, I don't like any of that fruit. You know, you'd have liked it back then. Amen. <laughs> you'd have been a fruit lover back then. <laughs> you could have got you an orange. You could have got you a banana. Whatever you want, it's there. God had made it for Adam and Eve to enjoy. 
Everything that they could have ever wanted or longed for was there. I believe that uh, the temperature was just right. You know, nowadays uh, we complain about the heat. We complain about the cold. We complain about the wind. We complain about the snow. Amen. <laughs> Some of us do. <laughs> Glory to God. I'm picking this morning, sis. Don't get mad at me. <laughs> but we, we complain. You know, I complain about snow. She don't. But, you know, we get to the place where we... we, we Complain about everything. Nothing's just right. Nothing's just perfect. Nothing's just where it should be. But I believe the temperature was just exactly what it needed to be. You say, well, you got a vivid imagination this morning. And I don't see how that could possibly be. This was the Garden of Eden. God had created it, as Brother Kobe told us this morning. He created it. And everything was done well. Everything was beautiful. Everything was perfect. There was perfection that was there. I, I believe this morning, if you will, I, I believe that it, the uh, the colors were just perfect. I believe everything was just 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 right. There wasn't a cloud in the sky. Amen. You say, well, I don't know about that. Now, preacher, you get this deep down. I, well, this is just my interpretation this morning. I don't believe there was a cloud in the sky. Well, because you might say, well, why is that? Well, I, I believe that because of the fact that so far it hadn't rained on the earth at that time. I believe it was just a place of spectacular beauty. Temperature right, everything perfect. There was relationship in the Garden of Eden. There was a relationship. What are you talking about? Adam had Eve now. But he also, more important than that, he had his God. And he was able to walk with him in the cool of the day. It says he was in, the, in the evening time. He was, he was walking with God. Or maybe in the morning time, he was walking with God. God himself walked with Adam. Could you imagine what that would have been like? My goodness, you know, we, we've got the Spirit. We have of the Spirit. We know Jesus. We, he lives in our hearts. But could you imagine what it was like for even the disciples to, to walk with God? They walked with Jesus on the face of the earth. They saw everything he did. They heard every word he spoke. Could you imagine? Here, Adam had that same privilege to walk with God. Could you imagine what it was like? And I look at this. There was no, there was safety. There was no fear. There was no worry. There was no shame. There was no guilt. There was nothing that was run amok. There was everything in complete tranquility. And more important than that, there was no death. Adam could have sat right there and lived forever. Adam and Eve, you know, he could have lived right there forever. No problems. No, no, nothing. But then things changed. The scripture goes on to tell us in verses 8 through 11 and 22 through 24, it says, And they heard the voice of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us, to know good and evil, to know. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword, which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Adam and Eve disobeyed God, which brought, brought in sin, brought in corruption, and worse than that, it brought in death. And the worst part of the death was not the death that they were going to face in the physical, but it was the death of separation from God. They didn't have that, that relationship. It was broken. It was no more the same. It wasn't what it was what once was. It wasn't what it should have been. And there the garden that was given everything that they could ever want and ever desire, now everything changed. Now they had to deal with weeds and contend with 
you know, I don't know, I don't know why it was, but you know, I was blowing my dad's yard just the other day. And I think I tripped two or three times over that that wire grass they call it, some call it crab grass, whatever it is, but I'm like, what in the world? And these long places of grass is one here and one there, and I I was tripping, I tripped two or three times the other day walking through, through there trying to mow. I made sure that it got cut after that. But that's what we got to contend with. Now you can't just plant your tomatoes and your green beans and your potatoes and all the things you love out in the garden and expect it to just come up and not have to do anything to labor for. And now you got to get out there and you got to get the weeds. And, and they got to hit them sometimes twice a week. Sometimes once a week gets by, but sometimes twice a week because then weeds are faithful. They keep coming up. They keep stirring up. They keep coming back. Now they got to fight for what they want to eat. Now they got to contend with rot. Now they got to contend with bitterness. Now they got to contend with sickness and disease. Now they got to contend with death. Now everything has changed in the world because they've left the Garden of Eden. Sin has run rampant in the world. Because of disobedience and sin, God can no longer walk with man and the way of the Garden of Eden was no more. There was no more peace of knowing God. There was no more peace of mind. There was now, it was now filled with worry and anxiety and fear. All of that began to creep in. Uh, things weren't the same. Uh, like I said a while ago, there's weeds, there's sour apples, there's sour grapes, and some people has that besides the grapes you eat in your mouth. But they had rottenness, and now, and now everything that they seen was not the same. What well, was harmony and peace around them now is replaced by, by animals. Now animals could have been their predators. They were at peace with them before, but now the bear could come after them. The lion could come after them. The tigers, they, everything in the, in, the, in the creation could come after them. Now they were, they're part of the food chain, so to speak. Everything changed. They're followed after Adam and Eve left they follow, what's followed has been chaos and heartache and trouble and pain and sickness and death. And what we see today is the same thing. We see heartache, we see trouble, we see sickness, we see disease, we see death. Over, over and over, we see chaos today. It's run amok. Kobe touched on this this morning. This world is run amok with chaos and, 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 and troubles and woes and worries and fears and stress. I was talking to somebody the other day, and, and you know, they had a, a small child, and, and she said, you know, it makes you wonder, you know, yeah, I, I worry about them and what they got to grow up into and what they got to face. And she goes, but, you know, I said, well, you know, I, I was thinking, I said, for myself, I said, you know, but God sees all that. And God's already made provision. And God's all going to take care of them just like he took care of us. You know, he's going to take care of us. Uh, we might not know how. We not, might not understand it all. But I believe God is faithful. I, I believe God is going to take care of us. I believe God is going to see us through this old world. <clears throat> Everything changed. Corruption and evil. You can go through the Bible and, and, and see that even the children of Israel, God's chosen people, they got ended up being more of a mess than the people that was in that, that God threw out of Canaan. <laughs> you know, all that land that there that God promised them, you know, he threw out the inhabitants of the land. He caused Israel to come in and conquer and, and caused them to, to, to be a kingdom and caused them to be raised up. And, and God did all of that. And yet, they ended up being worse and more evil than the ones that was there. The scripture bears us out. And God said, one day enough. But there was still, God's plan was still at work. God's plan was still at work. And he sent Jesus to be born of a virgin. He sent Jesus to grow up and start his ministry. And then he prepared him for the way of the cross. The Garden of Gethsemane, the second garden I want to talk to you about this morning. In Luke 22, it says this in verse 39 through 42. It says, he came out and he went as he walked to the Mount of Olives. 
And his disciples also followed him. And when he was at that place, he said unto them, Pray that you enter not into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast. And he kneeled down and he prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. The Garden of Eden, I mean, the Garden of Gethsemane was not like the Garden of Eden. The Garden of Gethsemane was not perfect. The Garden of Gethsemane, there was, there was weeds. Sin, this world had fallen to sin. This garden was not perfect. This was not like the first garden. It was in a fallen world. It was faced full of sickness and disease and the corruption of man. Perversions of man. All of this was what this garden represented. And in the garden at night there was Jesus. And he was in his corruption. You might say, what are you talking about this morning, preacher? I'm going to tell you this. Although Jesus was sinless, the perfect Lamb of God, he was in a body of corruption. He was in a human flesh. You, you, you might want to disagree with me this morning. Uh, but if you deny the flesh, the body of flesh that he was fully God and fully man, if you deny the body of flesh that he was in, then you deny your salvation. You deny your hope. You deny your freedom. Because that's what Jesus came to conquer, was this old body of flesh and sin. The difference could not be more stark from Eden as beautiful and serene to Gethsemane, a place full of man's fears and failures. There was also pain and misery and hurt and anxiety and depression, sickness and disease. And yes, Jesus here, uh, we see him uh, sometimes that, that we gloss this part over, but we fail. We fail to remember the price that Jesus paid for us fully. When we see Jesus here in the garden, you know, we, we, we say that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. We see that Jesus came and left all of heaven and all of glory and came down in a sinful world to die for our sins. And yet we get to this point and we don't recognize fully what Jesus did for you and I. We don't see it. We don't glorify him. We ought to be praising him every day for what he did on the cross of Calvary for the pain that he endured, for the shame that he suffered, for the things that he went through just so that you and I could be saved and have right relationship with him. You may say, I don't, I don't gloss it over. He was fully God on the inside, if you will, the spiritual man. He was blameless, the sinless, spotless, righteous. Uh, holy, perfect, uh, glorious, flawless, beautiful, beyond compare. The Son of the living God. He was. He was not just Son. He was Master. And He's King forever. And He's Lord. Yet He took upon sinful flesh. He took upon a body of corruption. He took upon a body that hurts. He took upon a body that has pain. He took upon a body that has disease. He took upon a body that's dying to become the Son of Man. He is also the Son of Man. That's, makes, that's what makes Jesus the greater sacrifice. Because He was glorious in all. In His Godhead, He was fully God on the inside, but He took up a, a, His own creation. He took up a robe of flesh. He took up sin, this corruption body, this corruptible body. Like I said, remember, He's sinless, but He put on a sinful body. He put on mortality. He put on that that was, that was already in sin. He put it upon himself. John 1 and 14 says that the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And he says that we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. We know that Jesus got hungry. For the Bible tells us this when he was in the wilderness. You can go to Matthew chapter 4 and read in the wilderness. There he was. The Bible says he was hungry. When the devil came to tempt him, he was hungry. We know that Jesus had a body that, that uh, got tired. 
You say, how do you know that? Well, the Bible tells us when they were on the sea that they found Jesus asleep when the storm arose. He lived in a sinful body. He lived in a body of flesh. Do we realize what Jesus did for us? Do we realize what he went through? The, the Bible tells us here in the garden that Jesus, he brings this body of sinful flesh under the subjection of the will of God the Father. This flesh did not want to die. This flesh did not want to go to the cross. This flesh did not want to face what he was about to face because this flesh made him the son of man. But the son of God prevailed. <laughs> oh, do we see this morning what Jesus went through? In Luke chapter 22, it says this. It goes on to say, And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him, and beginning in agony, he prayed the more earnestly. And his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he rose up from the prayer he was, and was come to his disciples, he found them sleeping for sorrow. Jesus prays so intently. He's praying out. You know, the, you, you know, sometimes we like see we, we try to gloss it over. We try to say, you know, that uh, you know he was praying for this and that, but he was praying to get the victory over this sinful flesh. He was praying to get the victory over the human part of him because he was fully both. He was son of man, he was son of God. And like I said, without the two, we don't have a perfect sacrifice. Without the crucifixion of the old, we can't have life in the new. Without that, we, we can't have, without the sacrifice of that blood, his blood, we don't have life. We don't have it. We can't be born again. Max Lucado wrote in a book, it was called Traveling Light. He asked the question, have you ever faced anxiety and stress until your sweat became drops of blood? You know, I, I don't know what everybody else faces, but sometimes we can all face uh, stress and anxiety, and, it, and it, it'll hit you without warning. Uh, and sometimes it, it, it can even get to, to a place of panic, uh, and it can get to a place of pain. Uh, you can have things in your body going haywire and not acting right, and it, you may even think you're having a heart attack or anything else if there's enough strain and anxiety pressing upon you. You may even think you're going to lose your mind from anxiety or stress or pain. But have you ever got to the place where the blood vessels in your face burst because of the stress and anxiety? I've never been there. But Jesus went there. Could you imagine this morning if, if they told us, you know, our crucifixion wouldn't do anybody any good, we'd just be dead, <laughs> you know. But could you imagine this morning if they said, today or tomorrow you're going to die at dawn, we're going to take you out and we're going to nail you to an old rugged cross. And we're going to put a crown of thorns upon your heads. And oh yes, and before we take you out to that old cross, uh, we're going to beat you with a cat of nine tails. Uh, and we're going to put 39 stripes across your back. And you're going to be beaten and you're going to be bloodied and you're going to be weak. And you're going to face it. And you're going to hang on the cross until you take your last breath. And if you don't take your last breath quick enough, then we're going to come along and we're going to break your legs. So that you can die. And yes, you know they didn't do that to Jesus because he had died already. But could you imagine if they told us that what kind of fear and anxiety would go through your body? What kind of, what kind of thoughts would come to your mind? Would you cry out, oh God, I, there's no way I can face this. Uh, there's no way I can see this. There's no way I can see it through. Would you try to run? Would you try to do what would you try to do? Would you try to fight? Would you try to do whatever else you could to avoid it? What would you do if you were facing the cross of Calvary? I'm here to tell you that same thoughts that maybe would run through your mind, run through Jesus' mind because he was fully man. He was 
was fully in the flesh, a body of flesh, just like you and I have this morning. That's what makes uh, the, him going to the cross uh, superior. That's what makes it superior is that he was fully God on the inside. He, he crucified flesh uh, on the cross. Uh, he defeated the flesh. Uh, why? So that you and I could have life. Without Jesus being fully God and fully man, we have no sacrifice for sin. We have no salvation. We have no redemption. And we have no eternity. Oh, but what happened in the garden? What happened in that prayer? Uh, there's a condition. Uh, doctors will tell you that people don't believe that great drops of blood came from his face. But there's a condition that doctors say. Uh, they got a name for it. I don't dare pronounce it. But it happens when in extreme stress or anxiety releases chemicals that break down the capillaries in the sweat glands. And that's how his blood came out with his sweat, out of his face. That's a lot of stress and anxiety. But Jesus came out with victory over the flesh. Romans tells us this, 8 and 3, it says, For what the law could not do, it was weak through the flesh God, sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemns sin in the flesh. <laughs> that means Jesus won the victory over flesh while he was in the flesh. Amen. He was sinless. Amen. He was spotless. He was still the Lamb of God. And he overcame the robe of flesh that he was in. He overcame it for you and I. He went to the struggle. You know, he cried out. He said, uh, Father, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. And he speaks this prayer. And maybe it goes on through the night. It goes for a considerable time that he's praying in the garden. But he resolves himself to say to this, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. He puts himself in the will of God the Father for the benefit of all of God's people everywhere that they could be saved, that they could be born again, that there could be new life. That there could be a relationship. That there could be eternity. Oh my, this morning there's coming a day that we're going to be with the Lord forever and ever and ever. What was lost in the Garden of Eden was gained back at the Garden of Gethsemane. What was beauty in the Garden of Eden got ugly in the Garden of Gethsemane. But it's going to cause us one of these days to be in the beauty of God's glory. One of these days forever and ever and ever. Hebrews tells us, For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points. He was tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us be clear this morning. He was in a body of flesh. He was in a sinful body of flesh. It was not redeemed. It was a body just like you and I have. He was birthed into a fallen world. He took upon us the shape of man. He took upon the body of man. And he defeated the curse of sin. He defeated the curse of sin on the body. He defeated all of the things the devil had caused the disruption. But God had made a way that we could become alive. And become new again. Hebrews 10 and 10 tells us this. By the which we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Hallelujah this morning. It was not just one time. He didn't have to go back. Just like they did in the Old Testament. You can go back and see Israel time after time. The priest had to sanctify themselves first. I was reading this week that Hezekiah had to pray. He had to pray. He prayed for those, the Levites and some of the priests that were doing offering and sacrifice because they hadn't fully sanctified themselves first. And God said, God accepted Hezekiah's prayer. 
Things began to happen so quickly. They began to do a turnaround and began to seek the Lord and began to look to God and began to pray to God again. And they began to do the sacrifices again. And they cleared out the groves and they cleared out all the idols and they began to worship the Lord God again. But things happened so quickly and so many sacrifices was coming and so much was coming in. They didn't have time to, to sanctify the priesthood exactly right. But God overlooked that because their hearts was right. They came to sacrifice and worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They glorified God, their creator. But Jesus took our place. And that leaves us with the last garden this morning. The garden of our hearts. And Psalm, it's the Psalm 51, David says, Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out all mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence and take not thine Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. David cries unto the Lord. One thing you can say for sure about David, he got it. He knew what, meaning this, that he knew that he was sinful. He knew that there was nothing good in David, but he knew that everything was right with God. He trusted God. He knew that, that, he was, uh, that God was holy. He understood that. He understood God's righteousness. He understood God's glory. And he understood his frame. And so he cries out to God. Many say that this is after the, the, the incident with Bathsheba and Uriah. And he cries out, God, forgive me of my sin. Cleanse me. Restore unto me. Take what I, I lost and gave up and restore back in me the joy of thy salvation. I, I believe this morning, if nothing else, we just need to look at the garden of our heart this morning. And, and I believe if, if, if somebody listens to this later, if somebody is in sin and, and not living right with God, they need to give their heart and life to Jesus because this thing's about to end. This life is about to end. What are you talking about? Uh, the, the things that are going on in this world, the Word of God has already told us they were, would be upon us, and here they are. Trouble on every side, worry on every side, chaos, uh, fears. You say, well, that's been going on for a long time. Yes, but there's, not, no, there's more intense, and there's, it's affecting everybody. It's affecting everybody in every part of the world. Look at this this morning. The Word of God tells us that out of those, those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth out of the heart, and they defile the man. This is, is what Jesus' words. He said, For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adultery, fornication, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. But what is the duty of man? Jesus said to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy mind, with all thy soul, with all thy strength. Do we love the Lord our God? Do we realize what he paid the price for sin? Do we realize, really realize what he went through? You know, we think, well, he was God. He could, he could went through the cross. Uh, you know, he, he didn't feel the pain. He could tune it out, but he didn't. He didn't tune out the pain. He could have went to the cross and not have felt an ounce of pain. It's true. He's God. But he felt it. He could have had a glorified body and come to earth and, and it wouldn't have done us any good because he's still holy. He's still righteous. There was no salvation. There was no sacrifice. But when he took upon himself a robe of flesh, just like ours, just like yours. 
You know, sometimes you look back at it and you say, man, there's more to it than what you think. But there, there was more to it than what Thomas was looking for. When Thomas was looking for it, except I see the scars in his hands. And except I see the side where, his, where the sword was driven. Except I see his feet with the prints in it. There was more to it than that. What was it? He said, except I feel it. Except I feel the flesh. Because I felt his hand before. I, I felt his touch before. I know it was real before. Except, except I see it for myself. Thomas couldn't believe. Jesus was in the flesh. He went to the cross. He suffered the pain. There's one scripture that tells us in Hebrews 4. It says that the word of God is powerful, discerning. It's like a two-edged sword. It says, piercing and dividing asunder the soul and the spirit, the joints and the mar, is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. If we want to know where we stand with God, we got to get in the Word. If we want to know where we stand with God, we got to get to God in prayer. The garden of our heart. You know, sometimes our heart can grow hard. We not realize it. Our heart can get immune to things. Our heart can get to the place where we, we're not touched by things because we see so much of it. They call it desensitized. You can get desensitized to things that you see over and over again to the point that they don't matter very much. But there's something that should touch our hearts this morning. And that's that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. If we sing the song of the old rugged cross and we're near the cross or we sing something about Jesus and something doesn't stare in our hearts, we need to go back and check again. I want to see revival, church. I want to see true revival in me. I want to see a revival that stirs the heart again. In Hosea, I believe it was, I was reading the other week, it says that, we need to, that Israel needed to break up the fallow ground. The hardness of their heart had gotten hard and crusty. And you know, nothing can live in hard and packed ground. You can't, you can't do anything about it. I remember uh, even when we was in, in school, in high school, I remember... Uh, there, there used to have sidewalks, but what if for whatever reason kids just walked everywhere and they walked off the side of the sidewalks? I guess it's because kids like to walk together, talk together, that sort of thing. And the grass wouldn't grow on the sides of the sidewalk because people were walking on it, trampling on it, compacting it. It got hard. And grass wouldn't grow there. Sometimes life hits us. We get compacted, we get hit, we get hardened, we get tough. And God's word is not allowed to grow where it needs to grow. So God, break up our foul ground this morning. Send in a spirit of revival. The last thing I just wanted to share with you is this. As I come to the garden alone, while the dew is still on the roses, and the voice I hear falling on my ear, the song of God discloses. It says, He speaks, and the sound of His voice is so sweet the birds hush their singing, and the melody that He gives to me within my heart is singing. How is the garden of our hearts this morning? We're all in a body of flesh and we could all get anxiety, we could all get upset, we could all get fearful, we could all get worried and stressful. But this morning I just want to ask us, do we forget we have a relationship through the Son? We don't have to be anxious or 
worried or fearful because there's a garden that we can go to and there's a place that we can talk to God about it all. There's a place for sinners in that garden that they can come and get right with God. There's a place in that garden that you and I can get refreshed and restored and renewed. And if the world is sapping the joy of our salvation, like David, all we got to do is cry and say, God, restore to me the joy of thy salvation. God created me, restored me, sent revival in me that I can be touched by your hand. And when we do, God will hear our prayer.